Hi, it's Dave. A few days ago, Elon Musk was interviewed at the Air Force Association, and he shared some ideas on how a company can excel at innovation. In this video, I'm gonna take a deeper look at Elon's comments on innovation and see how it can help us as investors. If you've been watching my channel, you know that I'm talking about investment topics from deeper angles. I'm trying to look at things beneath the surface and we're trying to gain the skills to identify the big winners before others do. And the big winners that I'm personally interested in are the companies that can do a 10X valuation gain within five to 10 years. And in that context, I've been thinking a lot about innovation and what kind of role that innovation plays in enabling a company to do like a 10X valuation within five to 10 years. I think a lot of times when investors invest in a company, they're not really looking at the pace of innovation or how quickly or how well the company innovates. And as a result, I think a lot of people invest in companies that are just very average in terms of innovation. If we look at a standard deviation graph, you'll see that the first standard deviation is about 68%. And I would say most companies that people invest in, their rate of innovation and the pace of innovation kind of falls within this first standard deviation. However, if your standards are a little more picky, you might pick a company whose innovation and pace of innovation might lie in the top half of the second standard deviation. However, I I think if you want outsized gains on a consistent manner, I think we need a way to reliably pick the most innovative companies out there. In other words, we need the outliers, the companies that don't fall within the first standard deviation range or the second standard deviation. Rather, we need the companies that can fall within the top 2% in terms of innovation and execution. And one of the main reasons why we need to pick the companies that are at the top of the top in terms of innovation, because in order for a company really to do a 10X valuation game within five to 10 years, they're gonna need to be able to tack on bigger and adjacent markets. However, when a company starts taking on adjacent bigger markets, they're gonna hit bigger competition, bigger companies that have more resources and that have perhaps better brand loyalty and more established products. And sometimes they'll enter another adjacent market and they'll hit a company that just executes way better than them. And so you'll see a lot of companies that are growing fast initially when they're in a smaller market, but when they try to cross over into bigger markets, they'll kind of flounder because they can't execute and out innovate the companies that are already executing well in that area. When investing in a potential 10x company, one of my main criteria is that they have world-class execution and innovation. Without that, I think their chances of really doing a 10x valuation gain within five to 10 years are quite slim. An interesting recent example is in the cloud storage space. You have Dropbox, which does kind of consumer cloud storage and they're going into enterprise more. And you also have Box, which kind of focuses on more in the enterprise cloud storage field. Now these two companies, they kind of exploded in growth in the early stages because there just wasn't a ton of competition in their spaces. Dropbox got a huge lead in the consumer cloud storage space, even so much that Steve Jobs wanted to buy Dropbox and put them into the whole iOS you know, ecosystem. And then you had Box kind of fill out the niche or the needs of enterprise people who wanted more of a secure cloud storage option. And initially these companies grew very fast and their valuations grew very fast as well. But at a certain point, the cloud storage space started to get very crowded. You had companies like Microsoft and Google and Apple and all these companies with big resources and great execution kind of flood into the cloud storage space and offer, you know, for example, in Apple's case, offer iCloud file storage or Google's case, their Google Drive for free. And then you had Microsoft come in with their enterprise cloud storage services, which are integrated with all of the other services and which were quite compelling. And now you have Box and Dropbox and they're struggling to keep up their pace of growth that they experienced before. And what they're needing to do is they're needing to up their execution and innovation game. They're needing to compete with the best of the best in the world just in order to carve out some extra market space. And this isn't easy and it's quite challenging and it could be an uphill road for Box or Dropbox unless they really nail the execution and innovation problem. Take another example with GoPro. They had these great action cameras, video cameras that they released and it really just became a fan favorite of sports action people. And you had lots of people raving about their GoPro. However, their pace of innovation and the way they executed, in my opinion, wasn't world-class. In other words, they couldn't take on the Apples and the Googles and the Samsungs and the best of the best in the world in terms of hardware. But more importantly, not just hardware, but in terms of software as well. And though in the beginning, GoPro established kind of a market niche and really dominate a market segment, as they tried to grow their market and go into bigger adjacent markets, they met a lot of headwinds. For example, the iPhone started to get better and better over time and started to take amazing videos and amazing footage. And then you had a slew of copycatters from China and other companies that are releasing video action cameras at a much cheaper price. So it was very difficult for GoPro really 
ability to expand and grow their market in a very sizable manner. What looked like in the beginning that it could be like a great company, it really just, when it started to hit the adjacent bigger markets, it just floundered and you started to see a GoPro just didn't have what it took to really be that generational or that huge 10X company. Another example was BlackBerry back in the day before the iPhone. BlackBerry was kind of the king of the phones and their phones were quite innovative at that time. Like you could do so much in terms of email that you couldn't do before on a phone. However, the problem with BlackBerry was their pace of innovation was just too slow. While BlackBerry was just kind of slowly iterating their product, you had folks like Apple who were rapidly innovating in terms of operating systems and software and hardware. And they were able to create really a revolutionary device in the iPhone. By the time BlackBerry figured it out, it was already too late. BlackBerry already had been established in a kind of a slower pace of innovation. They had absolutely no chance against the iPhone. All right, so if innovation and the pace of innovation is so important in terms of how a company can grow and attack and gain markets and new market share in bigger markets, then how can we identify these most innovative companies before, let's say, other people do? And this leads us back to the interview that Elon did with the Air Force Association a few days ago. In this interview, Elon focuses on innovation and how a company can excel at innovation and ensure innovation stays strong. Now, Elon Musk is known for some great principles in terms of running a company. For example, he talks about first principles or ruthless iteration or making products that people love. He uses ambitious goals and he uses common sense to get things done. However, in terms of innovation and how to encourage innovation, up until this interview a few days ago, I don't think Elon Musk has really laid out in detail his thoughts in terms of how to create a framework in a company to encourage innovation. So in that sense, I think this interview is actually quite important. The video clip I'm gonna show here is about six minutes long. After the video clip, I'm gonna follow up with my comments from different angles. So in radical innovation, obviously the workforce is a really key component of that. I mean, as, I mean, during your PayPal days, you were actually doing coding, mm -hmm. right? But in SpaceX and Tesla, they are so large that Elon can't do everything. What right, sort right. of things do you think about in terms of motivating a workforce like, um, uh, like we have in the Department of the Air Force that will help them become more radically innovative? What sort of things do you look for in people or in processes that make the workforce better? Sure. Well, I think the massive thing that can be done is to make sure your incentive structure is such that uh, innovation is rewarded and lack of innovation is punished. So there's got to be a carrot and a stick. So uh, if somebody is innovating um, and doing, ma making good, good progress, then they should be promoted sooner. Um, and if somebody is completely failing to innovate, um, not, not every role requires innovation, but uh, if they're in a role where innovation is, should be happening and it's not happening, then they should either not be promoted or exited. And let me tell you, you'll get, promote, you'll get, you'll, you'll, you'll get innovation real fast. Okay, <laughs> let's stick. Yeah, it's like, how much do you want? Yeah. So does that, does that carrot and stick approach help, uh, do you think, people be more risk averse or less risk averse? Well, for when, when, when trying different things, you've you got to have some acceptance of failure, uh, as you were alluding to earlier. Failure must be an option. If failure is not an option, it's going to result in extremely conservative choices and you, you, may not, you may get something even worse than lack of innovation. Things may go backwards. Um, so um, if what you really want is uh, risk, risk to, 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 you, you want reward and punishment to be, to be proportionate to the actions that you seek. So if, uh, if, if what you're seeking is innovation, then you should reward success and innovation. Um, and only there should be minor consequences for lack of minor consequences for for trying and failing. There should be minor, um, with a significant rewards for trying and succeeding, minor consequences for trying and not succeeding, um, and big and, and major negative consequences for not trying. Okay, so. 
if, if you have that incentive structure, you will get innovation like you can't believe. Okay. Now, now the, the real way I think you, you actually achieve intellectual property protection is by innovating fast enough. If your rate of innovation is high, then you don't need to worry about protecting the IP um, because other companies will be copying something that you did years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. You know. um, just make sure your, your rate of innovation is fast. Um, speed is really, speed of innovation is, is, what, is what matters. Um, and I do, I do say this to my teams like, uh, uh, quite a lot, that innovation per unit time, as I go, innovation per year, if you want to say it, like, is, is what matters, not innovation absent time. Because if you wanted to make, say, 100% um, improvement in something, and that took 100 years or one year, that's radically different. So um, it's like, what, what is your rate of innovation that, that, that matters? And is the rate of innovation, um, is that accelerating or decelerating? Um, and a, a weird thing happens when companies get big is that most companies um, or organizations, the bigger they get, they tend to get less innovative. Um, not just less innovative on a per person basis, but less innovative in the absolute. Um, and I think this is probably because the incentive structure is not, uh, is not there for innovation. Um, it, it, it's not enough to use words to encourage innovation. The incentive structure must be aligned with that. So, well, first of all, when we interview people, we, we do ask for some evidence of, of exceptional ability, which in most cases in, includes uh, innovation. Uh, this is not to say that everyone needs to be innovative, it's, but we certainly need those that are doing advanced engineering to be innovative. Um, and ideally, everyone is at least some, to some degree innov innovative. Uh, so, at the interview point, we select for, for people who, who want to create new technology, and then the incentive structure is set up that, such that uh, innovation is rewarded. Um, making mistakes uh, along the way does not come with a big penalty, um, and, but, but, but failure to try to innovate mm. at all comes with a big penalty. You'll be fired. Yeah. All right. The carrot and if, stick. Yes. That's the stick. If you don't even try, um, or, or somebody doesn't even try to innovate, or their innovation um, aspirations are, are, very, are, are not, not, not very good, then, yeah, they will no longer be at the company. All right. In this interview, Elon Musk shares a framework of how to incentivize innovation in a company. And he shares some important specifics on how to implement this framework or structure to encourage innovation. So let's call this an incentive structure for innovation. And in this incentive structure that Elon Musk lays out, it basically carries four main points. Now the first kind of key critical area of this framework is number one, you need to define the roles where innovation is required. The reason is because not all roles or job positions require innovation. There are some roles that are just more support and you just need people just to get things done. However, there are other key areas like for engineering or even management in different ways with strategy that you need people who are thinking outside of the box, who are pushing the envelope in terms of innovation and really progressing the company's products and services. So this first step is identifying which positions or which job roles in your company truly require innovation. And these job positions are gonna have a completely different standard than other job positions. Now the second step is to promote those who innovate well. In other words, if there are people that are innovating, that are really pushing the envelope, thinking outside of the box, coming up with creative solutions, really to push the product or the service forward, then you need to promote these people quickly rather than slowly. Sometimes this innovation can actually come from the job positions that don't require innovation. In that sense, you can actually promote the people from a non, let's say, innovative job position or role into one that's more innovative. And for the roles that require innovation, those who are performing very well and really are just showing a lot of innovative thinking and innovative progress 
those are the people you want to promote quicker because those people are going to become the people that are now leading other people. They set the values of the culture. And when you have the top people all excelling in terms of innovation, that's the culture that the company now holds. Now, the third step in this incentive structures. Number three, you fire those in innovation required positions who don't try or have low ambition to innovate. When you have someone in a position that requires innovation, however, they're not trying that hard or they just have low ambition to innovate, then you basically need to fire that type of person. And the reason being is these innovation required positions are crucial to the success of the company. Meaning if the company is not able to innovate at a quick pace, then as they enter new markets, they're gonna be basically out competed or out executed. Also, when you tolerate kind of low effort and low ambition in, in terms of innovation, when the person or the positions really require high innovation, what happens is you start to dilute the culture. Meaning the culture in your companies becomes less of one of innovation, but one of just tolerance. Trying to make people happy within the company. So to keep the culture focused on innovation and to keep your pace of innovation moving fast, you really need to have the courage to fire those who just don't belong in the innovation required positions. Now the fourth step in this innovation structure is number four, have minor consequences for those in innovation required positions who try significantly to innovate but fail. Let's say you have an engineer in a position that requires innovation and they're trying really hard and they're very ambitious. They're really going for it and they're really trying to think outside the box and they're working hard to really innovate and push the envelope. However, their innovations just don't work or they just have mistakes or they just don't cut it. In those scenarios, because they're at least trying, at least they're being ambitious in their efforts toward innovation, they have some potential. Meaning, if they could just correct their mistakes or keep on trying and getting better at the innovation process, then they can actually become great innovators. So in those situations, you don't wanna fire them. Rather, you wanna have more minor consequences. Consequences that aren't really a big deal. Maybe they need more coaching or maybe they need to check in more often Often with their superior to really show their plans. Or maybe they just need to do more training and more reading and more research as they innovate and try to innovate. The reason why you don't want to have harsh consequences for those who are really trying and being ambitious with innovation is because you don't want people to be afraid of making mistakes. Innovation by nature requires making mistakes. There's no way you can be innovative if you're scared to make any mistake at all. In other words, you need to keep trying and failing, keep trying and failing. And in that process of trying, you start to learn. And that's where innovation comes from. The products and the things you work on get better. Now, all four points in this framework for innovation is actually quite important and quite crucial. And if I were to summarize the whole framework in just like a sentence or two, it would be that innovation requires you to have high standards. And when people innovate, you need to promote them quickly. So that sets the culture, but you also need to fire those who don't try or who are not ambitiously innovating. If you don't have high standards and if you have low standards of innovation, the result is your company just is not gonna be very innovative. I think one of the most challenging parts of this innovation structure is that a lot of people are scared or reluctant or don't want to fire those who, let's say, don't belong in the right innovation positions. However, I think the point is that not everyone is cut out to be in a job or in a role that requires high innovation. And if the person isn't cut out for that, then they need to be out of that role, maybe they can be put in a different role that's more of a supportive role where innovation is not required in a high standard. I think one of the main reasons for Elon's success on a company level at least, is that Elon has very high standards for innovation and he's not afraid to let go or fire people who don't meet those standards of innovation. One example was in 2008, Starlink was kind of having some difficulties in terms of its pace of progress. Elon Musk flew up to the Seattle office and he had kind of a big shakeout. There was a Reuters article in 2018 that explained the situation. Here's what it said. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk flew to the Seattle area in June for meetings with engineers, leading a satellite launch project crucial to the space company's growth. Within hours of landing, Musk had fired at least seven people on the program's senior management team at the Redmond, Washington office. The culmination of disagreements over the pace at which the team was developing and testing its Starlink satellites, according to two SpaceX employees with direct knowledge of the situation. Known for pushing aggressive timelines, Musk quickly brought in new managers from SpaceX headquarters in California to replace a number of the managers he fired. Their mandate, launch SpaceX's first batch of US-made satellites by middle of next year, the sources said. So here's what I imagine happened with this big Starlink shakeup in 2018. The people leading the Starlink project, I think they were just too reserved. They were too scared of making mistakes. And their pace of progress just wasn't happening as fast as what they intended to, or as fast as Elon had expected either. Now, what I I think really irked Elon in the situation with Starlink, and this is now personal conjecture, 
was that I think the leaders of Starlink just weren't really being ambitious in terms of their goals. In other words, they were more afraid to take risks. They were wanting to take a slower pace of progress. They were wanting to check all of the boxes, making sure everything is okay before really rolling out new things. However, in Elon Musk's perspective, the pace of innovation is the most important thing. There are other competitors out there, right, vying for the satellite space. So Elon knew that they needed the pace of innovation faster. Now, the, the leaders of Starlink at that time were at least ambitiously trying, right? Trying new things but making mistakes, that would be something different. However, in Elon's perspective, I think, he deemed that these people weren't just trying enough. They weren't taking enough risks. They weren't being ambitious enough in terms of how fast they're innovating. So in that case, he decided to fire the whole top you know, brass of leadership at Starlink and replace it with people that he knew understood how important the pace of innovation was. And by doing that, Elon Musk basically saved Starlink. There was a big turnaround in Starlink and now we see kind of a massive um, shift in pace of how many Starlink satellites are being pushed out. And even more recently in this last interview with the Air Force, Elon Musk is saying, hey, things with Starlink are looking very good right now. If Elon Musk was reluctant or scared to really fire the top leader or leaders at Starlink at that time, there's a good chance that maybe Starlink would have floundered and we would have seen kind of Starlink not get off the ground. Another interesting example to speculate on is that of the Model 3 ramp. At that time, we had Doug Fields, who was an executive from Apple back in the day. He had come to Tesla to kind of lead the Model 3 development program. Now, as you know, the Model 3 had extremely difficult ramp production problems. There was just a ton of issues and so much that needed to be fixed in order for a production to ramp. However, at this time, you notice that there was some tension between Elon Musk and Doug Fields. Eventually, Doug Fields left during the middle of the production ramp, and then you started to see Jerome Kean play a more active role. Jerome Kean had previously led sales and service, and he had led the semi program, and he had been very active in many areas in Tesla. Jerome stepped up during that time and he came up with this idea of creating a permanent tent structure to create an extra general assembly line. And Elon Musk credits Jerome and this idea to really saving the whole production ramp of Model 3. As a result, shortly after that, Elon Musk promoted Jerome to president of auto. Now Jerome oversees actually quite a bit of Tesla now with all of their auto production. And I think Jerome was one of the key reasons why Giga Shanghai was completed on time and production actually started by the end of the year. Jerome also is actually another key reason why I think the Model Y is entering production early. What Elon Musk did in this situation, he kind of let go of the person or people that didn't have the ambitious kind of effort for innovation. And he promoted those that did who could think outside of the box. And as a result, these people with more innovative thinking are now promoted with, in higher positions are able to affect and influence the company in a better way. I think most companies, it's very difficult to operate this way because in a lot of places you have people that are vying for the next job position. There's a lot of politics that go on. There's a lot of relationship building and kind of promoting yourself to try to get to the next position. However, in this incentive structure that Elon presents, the key criteria to being promoted is actually your ability to innovate. And I think this is interesting because the ideal is one of meritocracy, is where your ability to innovate, to really think out of the box and make progress is one of the key factors, if not the key factors in terms of your ability to being promoted. I recently had a viewer share this question on a previous video. It's from many Lu Wu. It says, hi Dave, thank you for sharing. I'm wondering how you think about Elon Musk working on so many different types of startup companies. I know he is brilliant and he seems to be able to succeed, but he's just not focused in my opinion. Will this be a potential threat for Tesla? As you know, Elon Musk is doing a ton of things. I mean, he's CEO of Tesla, CEO of SpaceX, right? He started Boring Company and he started Neuralink and he's overseeing a bunch of other probably personal projects as well. Now, the thing to understand about Elon Musk is that he doesn't have any more time in the day than you or I. And time in a way is an interesting equalizer force. Elon just doesn't have a lot of time to manage a hundred or thousand different things going on in his life. So he's at the mercy in a lot of ways of the people that he has delegated major responsibilities to. In other words, the entire key to Elon's kind of company Company successes is not that Elon necessarily is brilliant, he's doing a million different things. Rather, it's the ability for these exceptional managers that he delegates great responsibility to, it's their ability to execute and innovate and to really push the envelope forward with all these products and services. Let me give you an example with The Boring Company. In December of 2018, The Boring Company held an event near SpaceX headquarters. They're showing how they had dug a tunnel and they're showing off kind of their latest technologies. I was able to attend and I was able to talk to a bunch of their engineers and the people working on the tunnels and different parts of the technologies. And it was actually quite enlightening. I came out of the event really impressed by how Elon Musk is delegating a lot of responsibilities. I think there are three main things that Elon Musk does when he delegates that really stands out. The first thing is that he sets really big audacious goals. Now these goals aren't unachievable, unrealistic. Rather, these goals are set by first principles. It's really set on what's realistic 
realistically possible to be done. For the Boring Company, Elon Musk set a goal to make tunnels as fast as like a snail can move. Now that might sound kind of funny or even not very ambitious, but actually it's very ambitious because the current tunneling technologies and approaches are far cry from the speed of even a snail. So in order to match the speed of a snail, I think it was about 10 times, right? They need to make 10 times the speed improvements to just get to that point. But for Elon Musk, it wasn't an unrealistic goal because he knew if he could just shrink the diameter of the tunnel, right? That typically is being dug. And if he could make improvements on the machine, on the tunnel machines over time, and if he could do a whole host of other kind of minor improvements and continue to iterate that he could reach that goal. And by reaching that goal, he pitched a vision of being able to really unleash a whole revolution of underground tunnels that would really relieve traffic in a lot of metro areas. By setting a big goal, it kind of gives direction to the entire company. It's like, this is our goal, this is our purpose, and this is the product and the means by which we're gonna accomplish right, this vision or goal. The second thing that Elon Musk did with the Boring Company is that he raised capital. In other words, Elon Musk set up a company, he put his own money into it, but also later on, Elon Musk also raised capital from other sources so that the Boring Company would have enough money right, to get the job done. The third thing that Elon Musk does in terms of delegation is that he hires the most capable people that he can find. At the Boring Company, I was talking to different engineers who are working on the Boring Company tunnels. And it was just really fascinating to really talk with them and how right, the machine works and how like the tunnels are being made. And it was most actually interesting to see what their background was. And a lot of these engineers and people were from other companies that were already working on tunneling technologies. They were attracted to the boring company to Elon Musk because they felt in their old jobs or old positions, they just weren't innovating or progressing that much. However, with Elon and the boring company's vision, they knew that they were gonna be part of something super exciting. I remember talking to an engineer who was just in charge of the bricks. So, I mean, this is kind of funny, but the boring company has an engineer that just is in charge of the brick composition. And the bricks are basically what happens after they make their tunnel, right? They have all this dirt left over and the boring company wants to make this dirt into a brick or bricks so that can be used in construction in different places. So I was talking to the brick engineer. I was like, so have you been working on bricks for a while and stuff? He's like, yeah, he's been working on bricks for like years, I think like a decade or something. And he's been with other companies and his kind of specialty is on the composition of the brick, like making the right composition of different ingredients to make the brick really solid and strong. And as I was talking to him for like five or 10 minutes, I was like, wow, this is kind of interesting. The boring company, even though they're just getting started, they're really serious. They've hired like some of the best engineers from all over the world to try to work on this project. They've even hired right, a specialist on brick composition to make the bricks really solid and strong. This is just an example of the thinking of Elon Musk. He's not trying to do things haphazardly, meaning he's not gonna say, I'm gonna do great things, but not hire the right people. Rather, he's trying to hire the best of the best. He's trying to hire the most capable people out there because he knows he needs those people in order to reach the ambitious goals that are laid out. Now, when Elon Musk has the goal and he has the capital and he has the team, now Elon Musk kind of focuses his attention on keeping the man management accountable. His main criteria is he wants the management, let's say of the boring company, he wants their pace of innovation to be fast and quick. He wants to get updates on their progress and what they're doing really to push the envelope. And if he feels like the management is just not ambitious enough or is not trying enough or is just too scared of making mistakes, then Elon Musk is not afraid to step in and make a change in terms of management because he knows that that's gonna be existential to the future of the boring company. In order for the boring company to have a chance of survival, they've got to nail the innovation it's got to be quick, it's got to be fast, and it's got to be executed very well. Now, Elon Musk might only spend 1% or 2% of his time on the boring company. So what does that really look like? It's probably Elon Musk is getting progress updates, right, on different things that the boring company is doing. And Elon Musk is occasionally giving feedback. But most of all, Elon Musk is monitoring the overall pace of innovation. Is the boring company really progressing? toward like the goals that are set out. So much of Elon's mode of operation, so much of his ethos and his angle of how he runs his company is based upon these principles. He's so dependent on exceptional managers who can carry out responsibilities and who could push the pace of innovation. Without that, all of the companies are just paralyzed and all of the companies can't progress forward. I think it's a misconception where people think, oh, all these companies are looking toward Elon Musk as their mentor, as their teacher on how to innovate. And all these departments are waiting on Elon Musk to tell them what to do. That's not the case. These people that Elon has delegated to are very capable, exceptional managers who excel in innovation. And that's the reason they're there. That's the 
the reason they're promoted, and that's how all of Elon Musk's companies operate. And this is the way that Elon Musk is able to handle more than one company. That's how he's able to manage, let's say, SpaceX and Tesla and a few other endeavors that he's involved with. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, I encourage you to do so. We're looking at investment and business topics from different angles. We're trying to get beneath the surface of things and really look at the core of what's going on. We're using deep quantitative and qualitative skills to really get us a clearer picture to be able to forecast what's happening. And in terms of innovation and the things I'm talking about today, it's important to have, I think, a good understanding of what innovation is and how it's created in companies because this gives a framework and it helps us to understand and evaluate companies in terms of how well they innovate. When you look at a new company that's up and coming, let's say that everyone is raving about and it's just taking over market share, let's say, in their market, the biggest question I think to ask is, can this company continue to innovate, let's say, outside of their small market? In other words, when they go to their adjacent bigger markets, can they compete with the best and the best in the world? And in order to do so, they need to have clear thinking on innovation. And I think a lot of this depends on the CEO. That's why when researching a company, I love to listen to all of the interviews of the CEO that's out there. I wanna hear their thinking and how they approach right, innovation and competition. I wanna see some type of extraordinary insight or extraordinary clarity in terms of how they are gonna encourage innovate and how they're gonna encourage right, the development of new and better products products and services over time. My standards of innovation that I'm requiring for the companies that I'm investing in is super high. I want them in the top 2% of all companies out there. Possibly also, I wanna be lucky where I might choose a company that's in the top 2%, but eventually they actually are outliers and they're the top 0.1%, let's say, beyond the third standard deviation. And in that case, you might hit a huge big winner. It might not be a 10X, it might actually be a 100X right, valuation gain within, let's say, 15 or 20 years. Anyways, like this video, add a comment or question in the comment section, and we'll see you in my next video. Thanks.